So you can get a chuck roll. That's my favorite. If you're going to eat only meat, that is the best thing for me. The best bang for your buck is the chuck roll. The sneaky cuts are like the chuck eye steak, which is basically a ribeye that is in the chuck. So you get a ribeye for a chuck price. I still say you're going to save about anywhere between 30 and 50% on the, the cuts that you get from the grocery store. The best part about what I tell people on my videos is... If you mess up, we still have we're still having lunch. We're still having dinner. If if that cut is not perfectly straight, you're still going to be able to have a good dinner. All right, welcome. We have with us today Brad Veach, who apparently is a butcher wizard, and I'm not sure where where did you go to a particular wizarding school for that? I'm thinking Harry Potter and stuff like that. Where did you get your wizarding training on this sort of thing? If you can get into that. So basically my background is that I have always been in food. So I've been everything you can think of. I went to culinary school. I taught culinary school. I've worked in restaurants. I've worked in hotels, butcher shops, grocery stores, everything you can possibly imagine. So it's I, I've worked in food for a long time and just really honed my passion for meat and meat cookery. So th that's in, in a nutshell. I've, I've done it all. So <laughs> Interesting. So, so what, what, I mean, cause you know, when, when we think about cooking, there's a lot of foods out there. There's, you know, there's all kinds of different, there's plant-based stuff. There's obviously, you know, I'm a big fan of the meat-based stuff, but how did you take more towards the meat side of things? Was there a reason that you enjoyed that more than the others? I, I think it's been a passion of mine ever since I, I went to culinary school and kind of went down that fine dining route of uh, working in hotels I've always been interested in anatomy, but never really good at science. So I never went down any other road. But I feel like when you are dealing with a cow and, and then the different parts and the different the butchery techniques, I really gravitate towards that just to it, it, it's it, it is an anatomy thing. So it's there's so many different cuts of meat like on a cow that they all react differently to heat and cooking and things like that and so some are good for some parts and some are not good for others other cooking techniques so I, I just really fell in love with that butchery process and when i started my youtube channel it was later in my career where i was at home i have four kids so i was stay-at-home dad and i really wanted to i don't know teach more and i didn't have that outlet to do so youtube became the outlet for me and it, people resonate with it. So that was awesome. Yeah, I took a peek at your channel. This is pretty interesting stuff, but I'll just, make, I'll just tell you a sort of a, a bizarre, funny story. When I would, I would, I'm a physician, I'm a surgeon, and I went to medical school, and then we had anatomy, and then during surgery, I remember when I was doing spine surgery, a lot of times we were doing the dissections, and they were long surgeries, and literally, you'd be in there, and you had to eat, and you get hungry, and you're like dissecting out this muscles around the spine, and you're like, God, that looks like a tender wall. I just, it's <laughs> not that I ever, I, I never indulged in eating human food, but human meat. But it, it's interesting that, you're very right, that the anatomy sort of plays out when you're looking at that. Like, look at it like a, oh, I don't know, like a steak. I'm looking at there's a bird, there's, there's a spinous process, and I, and I know that stuff, and I'm just like, I see that stuff. But So some of the things, I guess, a lot of the stuff is directed for what you can do at home because a lot of us find that particularly us guys are eating you know, kind of carnivorous that we eat a lot of meat and it can be expensive in some ways and i know you've had a lot of tips on how to do get some products and i saw one video you, you, you breaking down a chuck roll and stuff like that so what are the what are some of the for those people that want to do this at home like they want to maybe do their own butchery at home maybe not they don't have a slaughterhouse behind their house but they, you can go to you can go to the big markets and get the they big hunks of meat that you can break down yourself in a way. What do you need? What are the things you need to know about that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So basically what my channel has done is like, we looked at what, you can, what the normal person, the normal consumer can get at a big box store. So like I, I did a lot of stuff for Costco and Costco, my Costco has a lot of subcramal cuts. So they have whole ribeyes, they have whole strip loins. They have whole tenderloins. So that's where I started doing that. Also, there's another great place in my area called the Chef Store, which is like a U.S. foods open to the public store in which you can go in and buy kind of restaurant grade, like big cuts of meat. You can buy big cuts, of big portions of everything. But like I found there, too, that they had a lot of the subprimal cuts. So 
That's where I, so you can get a chuck roll. That's my favorite. If you're going to save money, like if you're going to eat only meat, that is the best thing for me. The best bang for your buck is the chuck roll. You go and you ask at Sam's, Costco, or whatever you go, you know, you're going to knock on the window sometimes and say, hey, can I buy a whole chuck roll? But in that chuck roll, you can find all kinds of stuff. So you have the chuck roasts in which you can braise them and do things like that. But the sneaky cuts are like the chuck eye steak, which is basically a ribeye that is that is in the chuck. So you get a ribeye for a chuck price. So I can get a rib, I can get a a small piece of ribeye for five dollars a pound in my area. And there's that's also more that's more board on the animal you know it's not like one of the very first yeah ribs because, because you have so the ribeye or, or the rib primal cut is next to the chuck primal cut so that rib goes into the chuck primal cut and they have to cut it at a certain point there's very specific when they're doing the primal cuts there's a very specific point in which they cut the chuck and the rib separate separate the chuck and the rib so there is a little bit of ribeye stuck in the chuck you can, by butchering it yourself, you can get that ribeye for a chuck price. It's the same thing. So it, there are these little nuances that you can really save money by doing so. I, and then you can grind all the other kind of extra pieces. That's the best. That's how you make the most of what you get, whatever you get. Whether you're breaking down your own ribeye, your own strip loin, if you can grind the the extra pieces, the trim that you have off of there, you're getting complete yield from that primal cut. Yeah, there's another, I think I saw like, 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 like a Denver steak, which I am becoming more and more of a fan of, particularly if you get a really nice marble Denver steak, like some people call it a Zabaton steak for some reason, I'm not sure what the distinction is, but that can be a tremendous, that's honestly one of my favorite cuts, you know, particularly if it's well marbled, it's, it, it eats really well. And Absolutely. What, yeah, when you cut that out, I get there's different ways to butcher animals, obviously. And you get if you do it one way, you're gonna get some cuts. If you do it the other way, you're gonna miss out on some cuts. So how would you if you had a big old chunk roll, you know, five bucks a pound there, I don't know if they weigh twenty five pounds or something like that. And what are you gonna get out of that? What would you do if you had that in front of you? Yeah. So basically with you, with the chuck roll especially, you're gonna get, I would say Two to four really nice chuck eye steaks. So you're going to get those ribeyes that are in the chuck. They're a little smaller. They look a little different. But again, when you grill them and you cut them, they taste just like ribeye. You're going to get, I would say, five or so decent Denver steaks. Now, Denver steaks, again, I can go on and on about this, but I love Denver steaks. They are, as long as you don't cook them over like a medium, then they are pound for pound, like the best steaks on the cow. Like it, it's really, it's a really new kind of cut in the last 10 years or so, because they went back and said, how can we remarket the chuck, like the, the steaks in the chuck? And they found this Denver steak that it, it really does really well. So you can get five or six of those, and then you can get a couple of chuck roasts off of it. And then I would say eight pounds or so of ground. From that, so when you're doing the chuck roll, when you're breaking the whole thing down, you're not going to have, you're going to have very little waste. It's a couple of ounces of waste of just this connected tissue that connects the bones to the meat. So you're, that's the part you got to get rid of, but it's so small. If you take the whole thing, you're going to get a, almost 100% yield out of this cut. Yeah, I think I was going to ask if the dogs do That's the idea of when dogs get all that stuff on that. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. What's so what do you have for somebody that says, Hey, I'm, I want to do this because it's how much money could you? If you had to buy those steaks retail price in the store versus breaking it down yourself, what, what's the difference in cost? Would you ask? Yeah, because excellent questions. Basically, even the Chuck Eye steaks and the Denver steaks, the problem is finding them. The big biggest problem is finding them. A lot of because there's so few of them on the animal, when you go through it. You may you go through the grocery store, you're not going to find them. And if you do, the kind of the secrets out as far as the Chuck Eyes and the Denvers. So they're also going up to that $10 a pound plus. And then you can get that whole Chuck Eye or that, that whole Chuck Roll for $5 a pound. And, the, and again, area to area, like 
different parts of the country, different parts of the world. I know your audience is worldwide. So different parts of the world, I'm finding that I have definite different prices of meat, but the proportions are still the same. So you're still going to save, I still say you're going to save about anywhere between 30 and 50% on the cuts that you get from the grocery store. Yeah, that's what I figured. There's obviously ground beef is going to be ground beef. Although ground chuck, a lot of people think that tastes even better than regular whatever some of the other stuff they use for ground beef. And then what do you need? Obviously, you need them. Is there some sort of, obviously, in probably the first few times you do it, you're going to mess it up by where that is it. It takes a little bit of skill. But what does the average person need to play tell us that chuck? What do they buy life wise, space wise, any of the supplies they might need back in sewer? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because so the whole, if you're doing a chuck roll, it is about 20, like you're saying, 25 pounds or so. So you're going to need a large cutting board, like th that covers, I would say, a, a 20 inch, 18 inch cutting board or so, just enough so you can get that whole thing on the cutting board. You're going to need uh, a couple of knives. I find that you can do most of it with the knives you already have. A six inch bony knife is great for the finer cuts to get to cut silver skin off, to cut connective tissue off, things like that. I like to use a 10 inch breaking knife. So a breaking knife is basically a longer knife that has a curved tip on the end. So you can really get a nice smooth cut through a large piece of meat. Those definitely do well for if you're going to do a whole ribeye, a whole strip loin, something that you need to cut it very straight. A longer knife is better. So many people can use just what they have already in their knife block. If you have a 10 inch chef knife, if you have an eight inch chef knife, you can get your way around those. But again, an, a longer knife for those different cuts is better. As far as uh, storing it after you're done, that is where it gets like vacuum sealing is the best where to get the most longevity out of the cuts. It takes the oxygen out. It it lasts forever. Like you can, whether you are keeping it a month in the fridge, whether you are keeping it a year in the freezer, if you take that oxygen out, that's the biggest, that's the biggest way to make your meat go or go longer or last for longer. Do you have like a meat hook or something? I know a lot of butchers, a lot of meat hooks, a lot to stabilize and pull on the other pieces. And is that something that you use in your other hand or how you stabilize the big? A lot you know, of things with yeah, yeah. A lot of things with the meat hook is when so butchers who are in who are bringing down a whole half of a cow, it's it's hanging. So it's gravity is working with you, and you can use that meat hook to pull and separate different muscles. I find when you're doing these subprimal cuts that most people will be get their hands on, you don't even need that kind of thing. It's it's all there on the board. So it's it's a little bit of unnecessary for me because I'm not dealing with a half a cow that's hanging. What about temperature? Because sometimes I find it like semi-frozen slices a hell of a lot easier than something that's really floppy and foamy. Is there is a way you temperature it? The colder you can get it, the better. With the larger cuts, it's hard with storage space. I will... So the way they come is in a cryovac pack. So it's in a vacuum sealed pack. And then that will last a long time in your refrigerator already. But as soon as you open that pack, it's really going to, you really want it as cold as possible so that it will not flop around on you. But again, it's a little bit of this like optimal situation versus of what people can do in their home, in their kitchen. Things are not going to be optimal. So you may have to pull it out. It's going to take you, if you're going, um, if you're going to break down your own ribeye, for instance, for the first time, it might take you longer then it would take me to do it who's done it hundreds of times so the more you get it the more you do it the quicker it's going to be the better but again you can get your way through it the best part about what i tell people on my videos is if you mess up we still have we're still having lunch we're still having dinner if if that cut is not perfectly straight it's still you're still going to be able to have a good dinner. Yeah, I found if it's frozen completely solid, then it's a problem. So it's got to be yeah. like maybe not a couple hours in the freezer, and then you can work with it if it be that. That's been my I have a meat slicer, so I make my own like jerky type products, and slice stuff, and put it in the tube after it. I find that to be quite. I, 
What about, because much of a cow, if you get a cow processed, you buy a hole or a hat, or you should have a center in the ground beef or something, something in that neighborhood, I think. How do you, so meat grind, or what kind of stuff do we have to do for that? Because obviously we can make some wool into only ground beef, but for you, the best stuff you ever yeah. have in some cases. Yes, absolutely. The, the secret to every butcher shop in the world is ground beef. So they are basically taking all of their trim from all the different things they cut and they're making ground beef. That's why when you get a hamburger or, or from a butcher shop or you get ground beef from a butcher shop, it tastes awesome. So <laughs> that's one reason is because it has all these different cuts inside of it. What I like to do is I have a freestanding grinder that I use and it doesn't have to be the super top of the line grinder. There, I've done with the KitchenAid attachment that goes on your KitchenAid mixer. It's like what you have or what you can get for an affordable price. If you're going to do this a lot, which I know your community probably would do it a lot, I would invest in a, a freestanding grinder because you're going to, it just makes the process faster. And then when we're grinding, we always want to worry about or always want to be concerned about keeping everything nice and cold. Um, and so we eliminate or decrease the amount of bacterial growth and that kind of thing to make sure that everything is nice and clean. And, and in that case, so the faster we can do it, the colder we can do it, the better. So a couple of tips on ground beef is, again, making sure everything is cold. When you take all of your attachments, all of your grinder attachments, I will put them in the whole thing in the freezer, the whole housing and put it in the freezer about 30 minutes before we go, that everything is super cold. And that will help out, again, decrease the amount of bacteria that can grow while we're grinding up the meat. What I will do is, through all of my projects, I will just freeze all of the trim. And when I have enough of it together, I will then go ahead and, okay, it's grinding day. So we're gonna go ahead and grind all this, all of our ground beef. You may have to add a little bit of lean to it. And again, that's a personal preference depending on how fat, how fatty you want that ground beef. But I, if you have a lot of trim from like ribeyes and strips and things like that, then you're gonna have mostly fat. So you're gonna have to supplement that with some leaner beef to make sure you get that. I love 80, 20, that's the kind of the gold standard for me. But again, that's a personal preference. People who like fattier ground beef or leaner ground beef, you can, it's completely up to you, which is why we do all this home butchery in the first place is that we want to have that control over what we're doing so that we don't just have to take what the grocery store has to offer. We can definitely, we can definitely customize that for our, each individual person. Do you, do you find that there are certain cuts of meat that lend themselves to better to ground beef versus something I'm never going to talk about. Are you probably never going to try to realize any ground beef I was so or maybe, but I don't know. Do you have a general guideline on what will make you ground beef or what's something's better as a steak yeah. or gross? Yeah. So what will happen is, so again, I'll take the trim from those other cuts, from the ribeye cuts, from the strips, uh, the strip loin cuts. I'll take those kind of fat pieces. Brisket is awesome in the, in hamburgers. Sometimes I'll have to, I'll just call it like sacrificing some of the brisket to make gray hamburger with. Again, your gold standard is chuck, is sirloin. Your leaner cuts of sirloin can come together with the fat from the other things you're trying to use. You'll find that there's no shortage. If you're doing this for several cuts, there's no shortage of fat to put in your ground beef, different kinds of fat to put in the, or different fat that comes from different areas of the cow. So it's mainly trying to focus on the lean. So the chuck, sirloin, all the things, you know, some round is really good, some different round cuts. You're basically trying to use up your extra for ground beef. So yeah, no, that, there's some that total yield from the other cuts. There's some people that will take a lot of people on these you your own ketogenic diets and they crave a lot of fat and sometimes they'll take fat trim that texturally still is in pretty good shape and they'll like just chew it into pieces and throw it in an air fryer, throw some salt on it and just eat that. But then there's some fat that you get off an animal, it's really almost hard. And you'd be trimming brisket sometimes. Sometimes that fat is really hard. You can't imagine you still going to eat that by itself. Is that the stuff that would make? 
turns out well in the bone meat. Yes, the hard fats are the best for that kind of preparation, for getting it into ground beef. I know in the ketogenic kind of high fat community, also beef tallow is really, really prized. You can also take that hard fat and you can grind it and then render it out as beef tallow also. Because it's, again, if you're doing this a couple of times, it only takes a couple of strips, a couple of ribeyes, and you're realizing like, oh, I have five pounds of fat I need to use or something like that. So it may go some way you go into your ground beef. You may make some for beef tallow and that's a great fat to do. I know traditionally the beef tallow is used like suet, the the fat around the kidneys and things like that, but don't sleep on just the, using your trim as other beef tallow. It has a little bit of a stronger, a stronger flavor. But again, if you're using it for cooking, it's just adding flavor to what you're doing. Have you ever messed with dry aging? And because a lot of times there's a pellicle that some people make that in the crown. Have you, have, do you experiment with dry aging at all? I, I haven't done a lot of dry aging experiments. I'm, that's definitely something I would like to do more in the future. Again, I've had dry aged beef and it has that great flavor to it. And I think it really adds something to it. But as far as using that, the pellicle, the, the stuff on the outside, it's, I haven't really experimented that much with it. Yeah, I've got a little dry at my house, and I've dry aged some, some ribeye and some primals in the arts, and you got all, because you know, you're losing 20, 20% of this stuff, and you're like, oh, am I going to do all this? And a lot of times I feed my talks, and they have that, <laughs> that's, but that's, that's good it works pretty well for the ball, definitely. But I know a lot of people turn it into ground meat and stuff like that. What about other, we're talking about beef, but obviously there are other, other right. animals that are pretty darn good to eat. Do you mess with some of the other stuff like lamb and walk or stuff like that? Do you do much of that regarding nature? Yeah, so you can do the same things with all the other different animals that are available. So it's all just a little bit smaller. Pork is great. Pork shoulder. There's a lot of different ways to cook a pork shoulder, um, pork belly, all these things. The, the things that I have done is take a pork pork loin. Is a, If you're looking to save money, the pork loin is a great way to cut chops and grind for ground pork. Use some of the fat. There's also there's a lot of opportunities there. I haven't really experimented that much with lamb. I, I like lamb as well as, but again, for different primal cuts you can get at the grocery store, you have your kind of boneless leg of lamb and things like that, lamb chops. Those don't offer a lot of the opportunity to break them down further. So you can grind all that stuff. I mean, you can grind ground lamb and, and that's delicious, ground pork, all that things. But as far because what I concentrate on is what people can get from a grocery store or a wholesale club or something like that. So that's been my area. What of you, I, I saw, I, I remember reading it, one of the comments, one of your videos, a guy who actually works in a butchery at, at Costco and says, if people just knock on the glass, they will often provide them things outside of what's on display. Is that something you find you just say, can you give me a whole chuck roll or something like that? How does that work? Yeah. The, most so my Costco is very helpful with that. I'll I will you'll see them restocking and you just talk to them and say I want a can I get a whole chuck roll? Can I get a? Uh, there are some people who have commented on my videos that they can't get whole like they don't have whole ribeyes out there or they don't have whole tenderloins out there. So everyone's a little bit different, but all these places that are cutting the things themselves, they have those subprimals in the back and they're going to be happy to sell you those subprimals. I, I don't know about the, I don't, the price difference can range between whether you're going to a grocery store or whatever, or Sam's or Costco, their prices are already pretty low for that. So you're just, the money savings may not be there as far as what they have, the subprimals versus what they have cut. There's a little bit of a price difference, but the biggest price difference is like buying a cut ribeye at a, gro a regular grocery store and then buying your whole ribeye at Costco. And then, so you have that savings, but you also have that difference, that control of if I'm cutting a ribeye, I, if I go to a grocery store, I just have what they have cut. Maybe I want one that's thicker. Maybe I want one that's thinner. Maybe I want a prime rib. You have that, all that control yourself when you cut it yourself. Yeah, I guess what I see when I go to the grocery store, you get often and very often you'll see a single ribeye in a, in a back, whereas Costco, you're not going to get less than four, three or four minimum. 
And then the sub primals are usually about I like two bucks a pound cheaper is what I find. Yes, it's a two dollar. Well, was this still considerable when you bought over twenty thirty pounds? You're saving something like thirty four bucks, maybe something like that. In cases, so uh, it's interesting. What as far as let's talk a little bit about your YouTube channel. So you said stay at home dad, have all these careers in the, in the various cooking fields. How did how does that evolve? I know you got a couple hundred thousand subscribers, which is great. How how what kind of stuff are you showing on that channel? Yeah, so it, the channel was basically a way that I could teach on YouTube. I never expected anyone to watch it. <laughs> and like a lot of people who kind of uh, do a YouTube video or some people like I, my eighth video was a ribeye video that I did and it took off and there was a lot of people it got over a million views in four days. So there was like some, okay, there's something here where it's not just me interested in it, there's you know, lots and lots of other people who are interested in it as well. Then I decided, okay, now let's go ahead and keep trying, do another kind of video. I did a similar video to a tenderloin where I broke down how to buy a tenderloin from Costco and cut it into, clean it and trim it and go into different steaks. And then that video did a million views as well. So I was like, okay, there is a need for this information. I just kept going at it and we started going into different cuts of me and I've tried a lot of things. I think it's the channel's about a year and a half old or so. So I tried a lot of like experimental videos. I, I tried to do a fun one where I like bought all the different kinds of pre-cooked hamburgers at Walmart and cost or at Sam's and those were fun. But like mostly what has resonated with my, with the audience has been those either cutting or cooking meat videos so that's what we're like going into 20 or going into the future with those those videos in mind so i was gonna ask you if you got much in the cooking side of it because obviously it's great in the butcher you got it from i eat it at some point and uh there are people that eat raw meat yeah, i know some but I, my preference is to cook i've been cooking for a long, long time and it, i think this tastes better that way and so yeah. when you when you when talk about cutting, cutting steaks, steaks and... obviously depending on how you like it cut, I, I hate their cut steaks because you can't believe it. It's really hard to get a medium rare thin cut steak. It's, it's almost impossible in my view. What do you do with regard to cooking? I mean, you have cooking preferences or ways to research certain things. Yeah, so I love a I love a sear a good seared steak, cast iron pan, keep it real simple salt and pepper, a little bit of butter at the end, keeping it super simple. If you think of the best meal, the best steak you had at a steakhouse, that was all they put on it was a salt and pepper and then butter at the end. And that's kind of it. So it's taking care of it, making sure you don't overcook it. I like a good medium rare steak. In fact, I don't think you can get too rare for me, but just cooking it the way you like it. And then just finishing with a little butter at the end is just, it's already good. We just, the steak is already good. All we have to do is not mess it up. There are several different techniques of as far as, or different technologies about using different thermometers and stuff so that for a person can get that exact right temperature that they want. Those are awesome because I worked in a steakhouse for a long time and you can just, they do a field test. They poke it. If you watch anyone who's cooking a steak in a restaurant, they're poking it all the time and it's feeling that the, the density and going, okay, that's medium rare. It's hard to do if you haven't done it hundreds of times. So some of those different different thermometers are great. Again, I, I just don't. It's it, it just don't overcook it. Is the best the biggest tip I can give. Yeah, I have a spouse for first things. I can be crazy. <laughs> it takes so long to cook a well done steak. It takes three times long and try to not carry that and shoe leather. There's some, there's some cuts that tolerate that better. Like a ribeye actually tolerates being overcooked more than like, a shoe on my and then, then certainly have shoe shoe log in for sure. What do you, as far as you mentioned, some of the simple things like this, the cast iron pan, which most people can get cast iron pans like that explains it. Do you have any other sort of cooking or butchery tools that you think would be nice for people to have if they can, if they, if they can afford it, like things that kind of, kind of game changers in a way? Yeah, I, a sous vide kind of cooker is really, uh, really good. Get that exact kind of temperature all the way through. Again, you might have to invest in a, a vacuum sealer for that to work, but you can do it with a, just a regular plastic bag too, like a Ziploc bag. I, I love those. I say 
right now I'm going down the open fire kind of route too. So I have a Brio. They have a, it's similar to a solo stove, but they have more cooking attachments to it. And it's basically a smokeless fire pit that has some grill grates that, that kind of go down. It's very low tech. It's all big stainless steel, but I've been really enjoying just cooking over open fire. It's like the That's, more we go toward technology, then we go back to just like, let's just cook meat over fire. I like I've the been, Argentinian asada style yeah. where he's hanging it over there. And it, it does get unique. unique interesting. But there are a lot of us, as someone who eats pretty much just meat, there are a lot of ways you can do it. There are actually a whole bunch of varieties out there. There are literally hundreds of cuts and hundreds of different cooking styles that people that do this sense to. What about as far as we have to have a big freezer to make this work? That's not yeah, so much. That's not bad. That's in the very early. Was afraid. There was a run on freezers a few years ago. We couldn't find them, but now they're available. But do you, what are your recommendations on some of the freezer sizes people have? Yeah. So I have, so I, I'm a bad example because I obviously go through a lot of meat. And unfortunately, I'm in a household where my family is like lukewarm on steaks and meat and stuff. So we'll, I can sneak it in every once in a while, but I, I accumulate a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I have just a, a normal kind of chest freezer. It's about a couple, like three feet high or whatever, just the one you would get at a Walmart or Costco. So the biggest thing with the chest freezer is to go ahead and vacuum seal beforehand because that will that will get, make it so that the meat will last a long time. I know people get weird about freezing meat and there's not really any there's not really any detrimental value to to freezing meat as long as you can vacuum seal it and get the, all that oxygen out. You wouldn't even be able to tell what's been frozen and what's not been frozen as long as you take care of it in that way. So I am a big proponent of getting this big cuts of meat, saving the money, going ahead and vacuum sealing them. If this is what I'm going to eat in this time frame, maybe it's a couple of weeks time frame if it's vacuum sealed, and then put the rest in the freezer and start rolling out through that. So when you said you sometimes like experiment with different cutting and cooking styles, and sometimes those experiments turn out better than others, is your family part of that experiment? So they, are they like, I know because you didn't want it, you mentioned this guy named Google got it, food from us. He does all these crazy experiments, dry ages yeah. and peanut butter and weird stuff like that. And sometimes it turns out really good, sometimes it ain't. So, you know, have you found some of those things in the maybe gone not like you find them? I don't really know about I don't have an instance in, in my in mind of I, I don't do any of the crazy yeah. Guga does some crazy stuff. He dry ages and hot sauce and all that stuff. I, so I try to keep it as much of I know that it's going to work. A lot of my experiments are more of, it's not even an experiment, but it's, okay, how can I make corned beef by its, like, how can I make pastrami? How can I, do you know, take something that's not just a go simple grilled steak, how can I do other things with it? I did do a, a video where I took the eye of round, which is known to be like the worst cut of meat on the cow. And I did like seven different ways. So I will say that don't microwave your steak. I did put a steak in a microwave and regretted every second of it. So don't do that. I did it for you. But but for, for the most part, all of these different cooking styles and techniques and different apparatus that are going to cook meat, as long as you don't overcook it, they're all going to give you a, a decent product in, in the certain amount of time that you have to give. What about uh, like salt? Salt in meat. Dry brining is a popular thing. A lot of people salt in meat. So you're going to first report for it before cooking cubes. How do you float salt in a place? And can you like back salt something back and seal it and put it in for, for how does that work? I have not seen a lot of benefit of salting your meat before 24 hours before you put it in the, uh, or put it, or before you cook it. Again, I go back to a, a steakhouse, a, every cut of steak that you've had at a restaurant, none of it has been dry brined. None of it has been like a lot of, another popular myth is I'm going to set this out to room temperature and it's, it, it would take so long for that steak to go from 40 degrees or less to room temperature that no restaurant would ever do that. No, it, it would be against health code violations. It'd be like all kinds of stuff. There's not steaks sitting out everywhere. 
when you get a steak at a restaurant, it is comes from a refrigerated state. It is salted. It is cooked and then given to you. So I try to like, keep everything as simple as possible. I don't want things to be so complicated. Again, like I said before, the steak is already good. You don't need, you just don't mess it up. And I, I haven't seen a, a lot of differences in the, if I salt it an hour before, two hours before overnight. So again, maybe that's an experimental video I need to do where you put them side by side, but. Uh, I've seen people call, and I've done that. I've dried brine and I stuck it on a kosher salt all over something. And it's just more work. I've got lazy. I'm, I'm like right now, I'm, I've got two ribeyes sitting in a sous vide right now. And later today, I'll see them up. That'll be my meal. And it's super, super easy. But I know there's people that will claim that. But it's interesting, the thing that you mentioned about how vacuum sealing preserves the meat. You, you will literally leave it in the fridge for weeks and weeks. Whereas, typically, if you get the stuff with the, the kind of saran wrap stuff that you see on there, it's yeah. after four or five days, it's starting to turn brownish, which is oxidation. It's not necessarily bad, but it's not going to keep much longer than that. It starts to, you know, that, that, that oxygen is owl. So... When you were back in the day when you said you went to culinary school and worked at, at various restaurants and things like that, what are some of the things that you learned there that may impact you, like how you do things at home? Because most people don't have that experience. I mean, some people do, but most people have not had when, when the culinary school or working in commercial restaurants and things like that. I think the biggest thing when people are cooking is that not, I don't follow a lot of recipes. I go off of the technique involved. So I kind of glance at it and be like, okay, what are, what kind of technique are we doing? Are we sauteing? Are we braising? Are we stewing? Are we grilling? What are we doing? And what do we want that overall product to look like? I think that's the biggest thing, especially when you're cut, when you're cooking meat is don't get too precious about it. Like we're not, whether you get crazy and marinate this and coffee and chocolate and wherever you want to, don't get too precious about it. Just cook the meat, cook the thing the way that it's supposed to be cooked. And then everything else is window dressing. So the sauces are important and that kind of thing, but don't take yourself too seriously. Cooking at home, especially is an adventure. It is getting better at something. The, the unfortunate fact is you don't, you're not going to be able to cook this thing, this one thing a thousand times, which is what restaurants have over. Like that's why restaurant food tastes so good because they have honed this one recipe down a thousand times to where it is perfect. But just have fun with it. Don't take yourself so seriously. And again, if you mess up, hey, you still got dinner. We'll still, we can always order takeout. I don't know. But like it's. I feel like people get so stressed and so tense about cooking where it should be more of a flow process of just have fun with it and just do your best and then make the same thing a couple of times before you say to yourself, like this did recipe didn't work. We'll make it a couple of times. And the second time you make it, it's going to be easier. The third time you make it, it's going to be easier. Again, I think repetition is the one thing that restaurants have over the home cook is just keep trying stuff i feel like me and you just cook steaks every day i've cooked thousands of them that's why i got that down pretty reasonable i can certainly hit a meeting my steak for clean regularity but what about some of the i know that some of the restaurants will do things to food to perhaps enhance the flavor that you might not typically do at home maybe the particular seasoning sauces msg sugars things like that does that commonly practice in a lot of restaurants how, how does that work it's not too much of a common practice. It's hard to tell because I've worked at some, I've worked at five hotels where everything's made from scratch and then everything is done kind of that old school way. We make stocks, we make sauces, everything is done like that. Then you, I've also worked in places, I've been kitchen managing at different places like a, a chain restaurant where everything comes in like a bag and the sauces come in a bag and all this stuff. So it's hard to tell because that individual restaurant, a lot of those chain restaurants, they're not cooking anymore. Like they are cooking, like they're cooking the main proteins, but that's about it. Everything else is coming in pre-made to just to keep with efficiency. So it's really hard with those chain restaurants to know what's in there, what's happening in that inside those sauces and inside those things. But like I said, it's just, it's a crapshoot between what restaurant you're going to. 
Yeah, and you, as someone who I, gosh, I cook a lot of steaks at home, and whenever I do go to the restaurants, I don't go very much. I'm often disappointed because I'm like, I could have had possibly a better steak at home for a third of the price or a quarter of the price or something. Like that. Do you still go to a lot of restaurants? So I will tell you, I have not been to a steakhouse in I don't know how long. It could be a decade since I've been to a steakhouse. I think those are the steakhouse menu is the easiest to recreate. If you're talking about going for a special occasion, you want to take your wife, you want to go and have a special dinner, that is the easiest one to save a ton of money on. It's just to make a steak, make the accompaniments that you want. You like mashed potatoes, you like baked potato, you like just steak, whatever. It's the easiest one to recreate, in my opinion. You'll still go out from time to time, but again, I find myself gravitating towards the more simple foods. So we go out and we'll have oysters or we'll have just like just different things in the restaurant. You pick different things where there's not a lot of shenanigans that has happened with that food or it's least likely to have happened. I I say it's a minefield out there. If you're going to restaurants, you just got to try to get the most simple food possible. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, I can remember going to a restaurant, maybe a chain and asking for, hey, can you not put it? I hate it. So it's weird. That's all I got to do. If you not put onions in that, they're like impossible. It's already pre-made and maybe even a lot from somewhere else. I know a lot of like dessert to ship them from some place else. Also, I worked at as a high school kid. I worked in a restaurant. I was a dishwasher, then a bus boy, then I was a room service waiter. Then I graduated up to to work at the bar. I think as a sixteen year old, I was I was more tall than if I was to get in front of them as a barman or bum. But I can remember someone saying to you know, some years ago. Uh, what is, as far as here in South Carolina, do you find that uh, there's a, a pretty strong meat culture there? I know there's a lot, of, there seems to be a lot of push to, to make everybody become vegetarian, vegan, maybe eat bugs for dinner. I don't know. Have you, have you contemplated bug butchery? Is that, is that on your to do list or anything like that? <laughs> no, n- not. Bug butchery is not in my future, I don't think. Yeah, it could be a unique, unique thing. Yeah, they have, they have you getting butchered, you could be like a bug butcher. <laughs> it's a niche market, I'm sure. I'm sure veganbutchery.com is still available uh, if I want to if I want to get the website. But <laughs> no, but like in South Carolina, we typical kind of southern town, there is a, a big meat culture here. We can we we can get meat at a farmer's market. You can get beef from my local farm and that kind of thing. You can go to Costco. There's lots of different ways you can get meat. I don't think there's not too many vegan restaurants where I'm at. We just we, we just like food. We, we like meat. We like a lot of shrimp. A lot of I actually from Oklahoma originally. We moved here about 12 years ago, and the seafood here is great. You can still get things that are actually like swam <laughs> in a decent amount of time in oklahoma it was tough being a landlocked state to get good good fish yeah, you're not getting really fresh seafood when you're getting salmon in, in pulse so that probably isn't like the fr- you know it's hard to think about it's going to take at least a couple of days to transport it there absolutely you grew up in Ob- i spent a lot of time in texas i went to high school college medical school it's like 20 some years in texas and i'm partial to particularly texas risk it the guy they do this too i think that's in my view, it's the best place in the world. I uh, mean, I know in the Carolinas they have different opinions on barbecue, a lot of pork ribs and things like that. Do you get into the barbecue aspect of it very much? Is that something you should participate in? Yeah, just very amateurly. I have, I, I would say I'm not that great at barbecue as far as I haven't spent that much time doing it. It's something I'm going to do definitely in the future, but like. I have, again, here where we're at in the Carolinas, it's all about pork. It's all about pork ribs and pork shoulders and stuff like that. So I definitely enjoy the the barbecue here. But again, it, that's another kind of hill to climb. What, what was funny in YouTube was the fact that there was such a different, like you have your meat guys, your grill guys, and you have your barbecue guys. So it was almost intimidating to go, okay, yeah. Like, I need to do some barbecue. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, I trimmed a few br- briskets, and I use briskets for a lot of work because they're like a 16 hour, 18 hour project, depending on the size of it. And so I do that. And about once a quarter, I'll jump out there and cook a pickle brisket, but it's a project for sure. What about you mentioned seafood? And obviously, there's, do you call it butchery when you, when you trim fish, or is what was up with that? 
I, I'm not sure what the actual term is, but yeah, we'll go ahead and take down some fish as well. I was thinking about clean. I don't know if that's the right terminology. Yeah, clean, the <laughs> bone of fish, the bone of fish. Oh, right? yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. How much, as far as your diet, you said the family is not as excited about steak. My my family pretty much eats steak every day. They're enjoying it. They they have it. I cook it. I'm generally cooking it for most. They like it. They like me smoking a lot for some reason. But do you, because you're making so much meat on camera, are you like, do you get to eat it very regularly yourself? The family may not say, yeah, the tiny steak, we don't have a steak, which almost sounds like blasphemy to me if you get steak. But what goes on at the house with, with Wyatt and stuff? I, I definitely have some spoiled children and spoiled family when that comes to it. They, they love, I do have a lot of meat eating kids. They love different kinds of meat. We love chicken and pork and beef. My family leans to, uh, goes towards more lean cuts of meat. So definitely when I do a ribeye video where I'm cutting down ribeyes, I will have to eat those for lunch or something like, or give them to a neighbor or something. They're not big into the fattier cuts, but like when, when we get to the leaner cuts, they're really into that. So again, I have 13 year old twin boys. As of right now, they are eating everything they can get their hands on, whether it's whatever it can be. But, but yeah, we, we are definitely a big meat eating household, but it's again, it's a variety of things. Like I said, chicken and pork. We love pork tenderloins, beef tenderloins. We can get our hands on them. I love all the, like I said, the Chuck steaks, the Denver steaks, the things like that. A lot of ground beef. So that's what we grab. We grab towards a lot of that stuff. You are like four. So you can only eat one cut the rest of your life. Oh, you bet. It's a great question. I love a New York trip. I think if I had to choose one cut, that would be my cut because I, it has, in, in my mind, it has more, it's leaner than a ribeye, but it has more character and more flavor than a tenderloin. So if you're talking about the, the I, I call them the big three of steak cuts where you got New York strip, ribeye, uh, beef tenderloin. I think that New York strip falls right there in the middle. One thing I did in one of my last videos where I did the New York strip was made a Manhattan filet, which is an interesting kind of variation on the New York strip where you take the, take the whole New York strip and you cut it in half lengthwise and you make almost like a filet out of the bigger piece of, uh, it's hard to explain, I'm sorry, but it's out of the bigger side of the New York strip. It makes like a little filet. And it was so good. It was so delicious. And I've, I've really been enjoying that those cuts. So you can still, even in that New York strip family, you can still make several different cuts out of it. Yeah, and I've seen, and maybe you understand, because some people said the Kansas City strip, there's a New York strip, and a strip one, and there's different, maybe the way it's butchered, there's, a, there's some people, I'll set or cut, I'll take this, there's a little bastard or bumble that sometimes can chew here. Do you concern, do you concern yourself much with this, with the functions on that, or is it... Yeah, so the Kansas City strip is basically just a bone-in strip. Yeah, it's a bone-in New yeah. York strip. And then, then as you're cutting down the as you're cutting down the strip, I'm gonna my hands there. As you're cutting down the strip at towards the end where it meets the sirloin, there is a little nodule of top sirloin that finds its way in there. And basically, what I tell people is it, it doesn't really matter unless you're buying grocery store cut New York strips. Because they will sneak those in there with a couple of ounces of that top sirloin stuck in there. And it's a little circle in the top of that strip. And it'll it's top sirloin, which is fine. It's a good steak. It still is a good steak. But when you're paying per pound New York strip prices, you want to make sure you're getting all New York strip and none of that little nodule of top sirloin. So yeah, so the strips have a little bit of things to watch out for, but the grocery store will try to sneak them in there a lot of times. Speaking of top sirloin, you're probably familiar with the what kind of that Brazilian Google would be a guy that would be a great performer in that. Are you, do you play with that much? Do you, because obviously you got this, I guess say the fat cat, which I prefer. I think that's a really nice cut. Yeah, I love the Bacanya. It's great. It's that sirloin cap. So it has, you know, again, it's one of those cuts that you don't want to overcook because anything you're getting towards that, the back end of the cow, so sirloin and round and stuff like that, you definitely don't want to cut cook 
to like a medium, that's that danger zone. So as long as you keep it medium rare, that is a great cut. But again, any one of those cuts, you either got to cook it medium rare or stew it, braise it. Yeah, slow and slow, so you get through pork, so hearty, stuff like that. Yeah. We're running out of time. Thank you so much for this. It's been really enjoyable and educational. Share with us your social media, your YouTube channel, what that's what people so they can find out some more. Yeah, you can find me on on YouTube, Butcher Wizard. It's a very simple. Just go ahead and search that. I have lots of different videos about how to cut different cuts of meat and save money. It's It's been a great um, journey for me or and, and teaching people all these things that I've learned over the years. Yeah, awesome. There's one thing I should ask you to make a sharp knife. That's a, that's a key. You got to have a sharp knife, right? Got to have a sharp knife. Yeah, you got to take care of your knives. And there are several different apparatus and different techniques to do. But again, I have a knife sharpening video on my channel. So you guys should check it out. All right. Thanks you so much, Brad. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate it.